we'll just start with a song that was uh, inspired by uh, some experiences that Terence speaks about. everybody to the Ojai Foundation. It's lovely to see so many old and new faces. When I was asked to introduce Terence, I wondered what on earth to say. <laughs> so I, um, I thought back to when we first met. And that was at Esalen Institute in uh, the spring of 1983. And I'd been living there for about nine months, recovering from a nervous breakdown, which occurred here. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was certainly getting better at that point. I was walking again. And Paul Herbert, uh, who was the sound person at uh, Esalen at that time, said, Leon, you have to come and do this workshop. I had done absolutely nothing at Esalen except to recuperate and he insisted that I come to your program so I did and uh, the program itself is a sort of blur of Lacherera, flying sources, mushrooms, uh, electronic intelligences, it's just a total blur, he, he spoke man spoke for like I don't know how many hours and I was who is this person I've never met anybody like this before <laughs> the one 
part of the program that I remember clearly, it's interesting, was in the introductions. You know, everybody goes around and says, why did you come, and that sort of thing. And Kat said something that just stuck, uh, stuck with me. And she said, I like his style. And at the time, I thought she was talking about your shades or your socks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, afterwards, you know, I saw more of what she was referring to in a kind of deeper way. And after the program, that of presence uh, in my hand, and that changed my life. So he's one of those people, a very few, a handful of people, that I can say have really, um, I've met at a crossroads of my life. And for that, I'm, I've always been very grateful. I truly have. So, I like your style too. <laughs> and, thanks uh, for Great introduction, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and a tough act to follow. Before we get into this, what time is lunch, Lola? <laughs> one o'clock? So we'll go to one? Or, or if you want to have time, you can walk around. Go to 12.30 then? Good. Can everybody here in the back... Uh, without amplification? Yes. Good. Well, if I get tired and begin to mumble, why bring me back up? Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is sort of a nostalgic return. I can't even remember. The last Ojai event was at Camp Shalom. I can't remember. It must have been three years since we were all together here under the teaching tree. In some ways, a lot of water over the dam. In other ways, uh, five minutes ago, uh, I've just come from two days of speaking in Los Angeles to large audiences which demand a sort of formal intensity that you thankfully relieved me of this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the... Well, how many people are familiar with my books or have been to workshops in the past? Is there anybody who's just utterly unfamiliar? Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Well, so there's, we'll work from that benchmark out. Um, I never imagined that I would end up sitting in this position and pontificating on the nature of life and history and global human destiny. I, uh, I started out simply with an, uh, a love of nature. I was, uh, persecuted as a child in my physical education classes, so I spent a lot of time on my own, and I grew up in western Colorado, where there is a lot of exposed sedimentary rock, and some of it has dinosaurs pressed into it, and I could always feel these dinosaurs. Uh, the largest dinosaur ever found was found a few years ago near Delta, Colorado, about 30 miles from where I grew up. And all the time I was growing up, I knew that sucker was out there. <laughs> and I, but I could never walk to it. Uh, if I could have, probably my career would have taken a different turn. But. Uh, my interest in fossils, I remember I had an uncle who gave me a book when I was about eight years old of fossils, and it had one of those charts in the front of it where it shows uh, five billion years, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column, and then the last half inch is expanded to the next column. And so I saw that 
human history was a hairline crack at the bottom of the column furthest to the right. And I got the concept of how old, not the universe, but the Earth is. And it was a dizzying perspective. The town I grew up in, if you read Time magazine, you were persecuted as a left-wing intellectual. <laughs> uh, the town I grew up in uh, once made it into Ripley's Believe It or Not as a place that had more Christian churches per capita than any town of its size in the United States. This was a town of 1,600 people with 42 Christian churches hmm. thriving. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I thought street corners were four churches. <laughs> I didn't know you could have buildings uh, on street corners that weren't churches. And uh, I would go up these dry arroyos with my rock pick, looking for fossil shells and uh, and dinosaur bones and uh, and this sort of thing, brachiopods, and in the in the solitude, because I would often not be able to con my little friends into attending me, because they learned quickly that it was hotter out there than decent people could tolerate, and also. I have to confess, I, whenever I invited someone to come along, it was with the thought that they would carry back the specimens. So they were essentially pack burrows <laughs> for my fossil expedition. And, uh, and then I had an uncle who was an old rock hound, and he introduced me to the concept of uh, not splitting apart strata to see ancient forms of life, but slicing rocks up and polishing them to reveal the light and the color and sometimes the crystal cavities that were hidden inside them. And so very early on, I got this idea that the surface of things is not where attention should rest, that uh, you have to, as uh, Ahab tells Starbuck in Moby Dick, you have to seek the little lower layer, and under the surface of things is uh, another reality a reality that reaches, in some cases, back to the birth of the planet, practically, or in other cases, uh, in other dimensions. I had uh, a fixation with meteorites at one time, and butterflies, and rocketry, and all of these things were about uh, a certain thrill, a certain iridescence that could be coaxed out of physical phenomena if you would not just simply dismiss them and pass over them. And as a little kid, I, uh, I had very bad eyes. I still do, but I wear contact lenses. But at that time, I wore very thick bifocal lenses and my mother, bless her heart, who was cut from somehow different cloth than all the people around me, uh, read Aldous Huxley's book, The Art of Seeing, which I had an occasion to look at it in the past year, and I was amazed how much of my own attitude toward life is contained in this fairly trivial book. You know, Huxley had terrible eyes, too. And he um, discovered the so-called Batesian method of eye exercises and, and eye health, uh, which at that time, 
you're talking 1954 or so, was completely sky blue crackpot type stuff. I mean, this was the Eisenhower era. And uh, the exercises that I learned when my mother took me to this, uh, I guess you would say, Batesian uh, therapist uh, were exercises in attention, in attention to the exterior world, and then the other form of exercise was uh, what the rest of American society wasn't going to encounter for 15 years, and then would encounter as Buddhist visualization. But for us, it was just close your eyes and the therapist would create capsules in the air through narrative and it was an eye exercise and so I, it introduced me to the idea of sitting still and watching what's going on behind closed eyelids what fascinated me about the butterflies was the physical iridescence which in the northern hemisphere is fairly rare in butterflies. You only get it in these little blue lysineas that you see fluttering around mud puddles uh, in dry areas. I've seen them here. But of course in the tropics, iridescence uh, becomes a more generalized phenomenon, not only in butterflies, but in beetles as well. And uh, I had the ability to fixate on these things, could spend hours with a single pyrite crystal or a single beetle carpet, just turning it over and looking at it. Uh, and then uh, at some point, again, Huxley keeps coming back into this, I uh, decided that I would become uh, a writer, not because I loved writing particularly, but uh, because I admired uh, all the attention that great writers seemed to have heaped upon them, which was something that I, as a goggle-eyed weirdo, was not getting much of. And I, so then the name Huxley recurred again, and I started reading through all of those novels, the, the social novels, you know, Antiquay and Chrome Yellow, After Many a Summer Dies the Swan, and all the rest of it, uh, Ape and Essence. And finally, I came to a work of nonfiction by Huxley, The Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. And this was by now uh, probably 1958. I was 14 years old. And in that book, Huxley, the quintessential English academic establishment intellectual, describes his uh, confrontations with mescaline and what it meant to him. And it was fascinating to me because previously all I had ever known or heard about drugs was what I had learned from reading Huxley's novel, Brave New World, which is a, a, a pharmacological dystopia, if there ever was one, and has lots to say to society today, I think. If you haven't read it, I recommend it to you. If you have read it, you recall that it was a society of people, perfect people, grown in vats, who died early, but who never lost the bloom of their youth, who were herd-minded, driven by advertising, and entirely dependent for their happiness and psychic equilibrium on a drug called Soma. And they had little advertising slogans which they would repeat by rote if anyone displayed inappropriate anger or emotion. A gram is better than a dam, they would display to public a drug sound proposition. Here is this same author writing of mescaline 
and reaching for metaphors drawn from Meister Eckhart, St. John of the Cross, John Chrysostom, comparing the, the light falling into the folds of his trousers to the light of Caravaggio and Duccio and Fra Angelico. And um, I was amazed. I had never heard such carryings on. Well, now, if you go back and look at the, the doors of perception, you realize that this was not an extravagant telling of the nature of the psychedelic dimension. It was, in fact, a fairly conservative rendering, a description of uh, low-dose, eyes-open, thoughty psychedelic voyaging. I mean, it's been a long, long time since I've set a stack of Abrams art books by my left knee before I take a psychedelic. But back then, that was how it was done. And you looked at the visible world. Well, so then, around this time, there began to be alarmist uh, articles in the press about the abuse of blue morning glory seeds by some of the more uh, crazed and unassimilated members of uh, American society. And I immediately tore out and purchased a couple of packets of blue morning glory seeds. And, uh, and, uh, and then noticed that uh, the leaves imprinted in the fabric of the drapes in the living room all seemed to have little faces and were <laughs> dancing. This was, in fact, clearly the intent of the designer, but something that in all the years of living around these ratty drapes, I had <laughs> never noticed. And then I began to look at everything around me and discovered that this affinity for looking into things that my rock hunting, butterfly collecting uh, habits had instilled in me had become like turbocharged. And swimming in the depths of polished stones, ponds, the ditch running down the back of the backyard were myriads of worlds. And I went outside and I was looking around at everything and then I, I just felt physically overcome. My knees basically gave way underneath me. And I sat down under a tree and I closed my eyes. And my life has never been the same since. Because there, waiting behind closed eyelids, were, uh, you know, ruined cities covered with creeping jeweled lichens and uh, inhabited by shining-eyed creatures that were, I was not sure exactly what, and much, much more. And I just spent a half hour or so literally in trance gazing into this unfolding reverie of deserts, jungles, machines, archaeological artifactria, machines in orbit around alien worlds, all of this stuff. And uh, I was stunned. I still am stunned. And that essentially set the compass for my, uh, the rest of my intellectual life. I didn't understand, really, what had happened. In other words, I didn't clearly get it that this was a trip and that it was induced by the psychedelic. I understood something of that, but I thought also it must be unique. It must be my mood, my expectation. Or surely this cannot happen on demand through the simple act of eating morning glory seeds being sold at 35 cents a pack down 
at the hardware store. Um, and so then I began to ask questions. And I quickly began to ask questions. And I quickly discovered it was a mistake. So I went to Huxley and read more carefully saw that he was working from the earlier of Havelock Ellis, Weir Mitchell, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow. Uh, it turned out that this, this whole tradition, albeit an underground tradition in Western intellectual or aesthetic concern, based around the perturbation of consciousness with substances. Uh, Coleridge comes to mind as an example. And uh, you may know his poem, Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan was written in a flash, basically, based on an opium reverie. Coleridge was uh, an aficionado laudanum which was a, a tinctured form of opium that had a great vogue in the 19th century. Well, I knew nothing about opium or laudanum or the style of the 19th century English intelligentsia, but in the lines of Kublai Khan, I could feel this same siren song of iridescence that had been in the pyrite crystal, in the butterfly wing, uh, in the beetle bodies. Uh, here, let's go out on a limb and really take a chance here. In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a state dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers girdled round and there blossomed many an incense-bearing tree. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion the sacred river ran. And it goes on and on and then it says it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. And that notion, not the sunny pleasure dome itself, but the notion of a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice introduced me to the concept of what's called in alchemy coincidentia oppositorum, where two things which are mutually exclusive are juxtaposed in a way which creates a shock in the mind, a poetic shock that is then potentially memorable. Years later, I used this effect to uh, title my book. So that's why you get the invisible landscape, true hallucination. See, this is uh, all hideously contrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, and after many adventures too painful to recall, I ended up at Berkeley in the fall of 1965, with that Berkeley in the fall of 1965, which was what an incredibly probably the most together thing I've ever achieved with my life in terms of domain, because I was neither early nor late. I was not ten miles off or a thousand miles off. I was dead on. I was right at the very center of the flowering of the cultural revolution that is now vilified and fondly recalled as the 1960s. And... Uh, I was living in a ratty rooting house in San Francisco that summer before going over to Berkeley. And there was a guy living across the hall from me who uh, replaced all the white light bulbs in his apartment with red light bulbs and painted his windows black and played 
the main chords of freight train on his slack guitar over and over again. And uh, he went on to glory as uh, Barry Melton, the lead guitarist of Country Joe and the Fish. And I didn't know it, but at the time they were in the studio laying down the tracks for uh, electric music for the mind and the body, which was one of the defining freak albums of that era. And he introduced me to uh, the joys of cannabis and further to something called Sandos LSD, which was uh, going around in these little tiny double O capsules. And uh, it was as if the previous Morning Glory vision had now been lifted to a whole other level of intensity. And everyone around me was undergoing these kinds of experiences. And there was a sense of incredibly accelerated change. You could palpably feel the acceleration of change seemed to be in the water, in the air. Uh, once I moved to Berkeley, I, I noticed that the large billboard that they changed for Telegraph Avenue every 30 days contained cryptic messages uh, that were inevitably addressed to me and my uh, affinity group. Uh, in short, serious boundary dissolution and category and scramblement was creeping into my uh, mental universe. And then, after about six months of this, I had a very strange friend who lived in Palo Alto. He, uh, he still is my great inspiration. I wish I could coax him into public display <laughs> because he's the real Terence McKenna. <laughs> but if you're the real Terence McKenna, you have too much good taste to ever do what I do. <laughs> so, uh, but he came to me. His, his style was to, to get there first whatever it was, to do it, to reject it, and to be absolutely contemptuous of it by the time anybody else even arrived at the scene of the crime. So in early 1967, he came to my house in Berkeley one rainy February night, and he said, uh, something you might be interested in. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, this is a material that has been boosted from an army research project being run down at SRI, and someone managed to get a 50-gallon drum of this material out of the inventory without anybody knowing. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's called DMT. And I said, it's a psychedelic drug, right? And he said, right. And I said, how long does it last? And he said, three minutes. And I said, no problem, bring it on. <laughs> because after all, I had been assaulted by Life magazine on the subject of LSD, and I had gotten that under my belt, and I was by now uh, relatively sophisticated about cannabis. I figured there were probably no more frontiers to cross. And uh, so we sat down then and there and uh, did it. And about 15 seconds after toking up on this stuff, I found myself plunged into an elf nest somewhere on the other side of the universe. In other words, there were, um, and thank God no one fills in for me because they know it so well, uh, <laughs> jewel self-dribbling basketballs. Did I get it right? <laughs> jewel self-dribbling basketballs that came bounding toward me 
from all corners of this domed underground space. Well, I had been used to hallucinations, acceleration of thought, funny ideas, strange insights, hysterical waves of giggling, so forth and so on. I had never seen anything like what I was now face to face with. And also, whatever this substance was, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect my perception of who I was. In other words, it seemed to me that the drug wasn't working. It was simply that the world had disappeared and been replaced by something else. And I was still who I had been a few moments before, except now I was fairly alarmed by what had just happened to the architecture and geography of uh, Southern Telegraph <laughs> Avenue. And these... Uh, these things, there was an overwhelming sense of affection, involvement, a sense that I hadn't experienced since being six years old and being released on Christmas morning to run out to the Christmas tree. And there was a sense of childlike innocence under conditions of extraordinary alien unfoldment and just I was boggled the mind boggled I at last understood the real meaning of this uh, uh, new cliche at that time and these things were making objects with their voices they were singing in this unearthly crystalline, punning, elf chatter kind of language. But it was not something simply heard. It was something which I could see. I could see syntax unfolding like ribbons being spewed out of machines, shooting across my visual field, rolling into balls, condensing as objects with rotating crystalline facets and machined interiors of gold and ivory and chrysolite. And these objects were themselves emitting strange singing language-like noises. And the whole thing was happening at an enormous speed, almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon run backwards at about three times ordinary speed. Well, I barely had time to take all of this in and, you know, assure myself that I wasn't dying before it collapsed the way a tent collapses, the way an ice cream cone melts, the way an erection disappears, the way an investment goes bad. <laughs> it just was gone. And... Uh, my friend, I was sitting there, I opened my eyes, and my friend said, so what do you think? <laughs> and I was, uh, I was uh, stunned. I've never actually seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me. I, for about 15 minutes, all I could say was, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. It's, you, call that you call that a drug? <laughs> you, you must be nuts. It, drugs don't do that. I mean, drugs speed you up, slow you down, make you fall down, stuff like that. This is no drug. It's magic. It masquerades as a drug. It's a doorway into another world. I kept having the image of Aladdin's lamp my favorite fairy tale and I felt like Aladdin you know you buy something in a junk shop you take it home you try to clean it up the next thing you know a flame a mile high pours out and demands to do your bidding that was the impression I had and it's the impression I still have that must have been 
early 1966, 66, 76, 86, what is it, 36 years ago? That's not possible, 26 years ago. Nothing has particularly changed. Nothing has ever surpassed it. And it, for me, that was the moment that set my auto compass for life. I mean, I said, this I must understand. Not only did my mother not tell me and my father not tell me, but Aldous Huxley never told me, and neither did John of the Cross, and neither did Meister Eckhart. All those people were apparently flying at a lower altitude than I. Ninth, those people were apparently flying at a lower altitude than I. Ninth, those people were apparently flying at a lower altitude than I. Ninth, those people were apparently flying at a lower altitude than I. Ninth, those people were apparently... Well, it's hard to put it into words exactly, especially when you try to do it for the first time. Obviously, the difference between a living person and a dead person, there is a way of thinking about that where you would say the difference is a chemical one. In one case, metabolism is going on, in the other case, not. I, I be, am beginning to think that this narrowing of our conscious focus into three dimensions for survival purposes that I mentioned a few minutes ago may have actually cut us off not only from where the game will be next month or, or uh, who stole the chicken, but it also may have cut us off from contact with the after-death world because it has no efficacy in the, the very nitty-gritty blood and muscle problem of day-to-day -day survival. And that what we have discovered in DMT is literally a chemical doorway to the bardo. And that this, I think, is an even more confounding notion than the notion that we are being ceremonially managed by zeta reticulans or something like that. I mean, after all, if that were the case, it would probably just be one of many programs of social manipulation that are administered by some hideous bureaucracy somewhere beyond Agal and uh, there's careerism and blunders and budget overruns and in other words it sort of comes back down into uh, that's what, what the problem I have with all extraterrestrial scenarios is the extraterrestrial seems so much like ourselves uh, I think probably it's that we are we have found the pharmacological key to the bargain and that this is going to over, overturn civilization so completely that we might as well just call an end to it and recess the meeting that uh, and if you ask shamans about this you say you know what is this all about they, they will tell you, well, we do all our work through ancestor magic. Well, ancestor is a very sanitized term because not too many people, when they hear the word ancestor, realize that we're talking dead people here. So when a shaman tells you he works with the ancestors, he's, talking, he's saying he works with dead people. Well, hmm. uh, if that's the case, then uh, we are close to being able to secure, in a rational sense, the answer to one of the questions that has driven us most bunny in, during, throughout history, which is, is there continuity of something? after the body dissolves. And I am the last person 
to ever carry this message into society. I was raised Catholic. I rejected it. At age 14, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean Genet, Friedrich Nietzsche, these were my gods. And I felt, you know, that moral responsibility, existential honesty, demands that we put aside the cheerful fairy tales of more naive levels of culture, and that anybody who wants to talk to you about the dear departed and all that is, you know, in the grip of menopausal mysticism or something, <laughs> or just hasn't carried out a rational analysis of what he is. The, now, I think, you know, these religions have all made hay out of, the, and hash, I might add, out of their um, imagined franchise of the after-death world, because they use it to beat you on the head with some moral laundry list of do's and don'ts that's very dear to them. And it can be anything as nuts as that you shouldn't be pork to who knows what, you know. On all sides of the world, and has only been thrown into question by the scientific uh, high-tech democracies in the last 500 years or so, and for them only among a secular educated elite, the premise that is that there is something that persists beyond life. And I think that uh, part of the uh, profligate irresponsibility of modern life arises from the fact that we don't think we have dues to pay. We don't think, we think there's an easy way out and that you could be a jerk and then just become food for worms and nobody will ever get on your case about it. <laughs> and so moral relativism has come into play. But if, in fact, we are securing in some form the notion that the human personality or some portion of it persists after death and that there is an ecology of souls and that we must, in some sense, share this planet with them because, after all, when you smoke DMT, you don't go anywhere physically. You simply see your nearby environment from a different dimension through different eyes, then it means that we represent a tiny minority of the human beings who care about this planet. We, the living, are just a tiny slice of who cares and who is active in the situation and somehow we are being uh, through chance which I don't believe in or through design which seems everywhere around us we are being brought up short and told that uh, in order for the earth to survive we must join everyone else in this other place and that it is not to be conceived of as dissolution, it is to be conceived of as disembodied. This is the only thing I can figure out that is going on. There is some kind of project underway to transfer the lump of living into the realm of the grateful dead. <laughs> and... Uh, the anxiety that we feel about death is the anxiety is an anxiety born essentially of ignorance and this ignorance is understandable because we have suppressed repressed and denied shamanism <coughs> the leadership role that it should have in metaphysics of all sorts and so now we're about to become extinct. And uh, you can like it or you can not like it. You can decry it as the greatest tragedy ever to befall us or this planet, although I suspect the planet will heave an enormous sigh of relief. <laughs> but there is a perspective in which 
it can actually be seen as progress that we are all at once going to transit into this bardo realm. Now this may not be it. It may not be a simple die-off. It may be that somehow a dialogue can be set up with these um, souls or their representatives or whatever they are in this other place and that a world can be established which is neither quite theirs nor quite ours. In other words, that the difference between being alive and being dead, which seems to us fairly fundamental, could in fact turn out to be fairly minor and erasable, or the boundary could be moved from where it is to somewhere else. Uh, we, this stuff is hackle raising in its weirdness, but if you're going to be true to the content of the experience, then I think you're pushed in these kinds of directions. And the, the attractor at the end of history that seems to be pulling the human world, certainly, if not all of space and time, into its domain is uh, in the act of realizing itself going to obliterate the kind of distinctions that we have grown used to, excuse me, even on such fundamental issues as life and death. That's the grandest conception that I've been able to come up with, and it doesn't require friendly, altruistic, extraterrestrial flying in from Betelgeuse, and it doesn't uh, involve nanotechnological downloading of everybody into a gold deterbium cube buried on the back side of the moon. <laughs> and it doesn't uh, involve the human enterprise simply becoming a, a layer in shale somewhere in the strata of the paleontological record of life on this planet. It is, you know, a fitting denouement for the mess that we have wandered into. It does require unlimbering of the imagination to come to terms with this, because we are in great denial over the possibility that the world could really be transforming itself. I mean, about as far as most of us can go without getting metaphysically uncomfortable is to embrace recycling and population control but I doubt that such cheerful uh, diddling with the machinery will be able to swerve us from our path. I think, uh, like it or not, we are going into a world that we literally, as we sit here, cannot conceive of. A world so different from ordinary reality that to discuss whether we will be alive or dead in that world is mere quibbling. There's one point I wanted to clar clarify real quick. I didn't see this launching of the alien psychedelic spore templates as a bureaucratic enterprise. I almost always envisioned it as a real provisional underground thing to be done by a small minority of shamans in a, in a you know, desperate hope to somehow you know, propagate their... their uh, their origins. You mean alien shaman? Yeah, yeah. It could be that. I, I, I think, I, I sense a crisis in the physics of the matrix itself. In other words, I think that this is not only happening to human beings. I'm serious when I say, you know, there's only 20 years of history left and we still have half of it to do. We're going to have to do some pretty fast stepping. I mean, what we took 50,000 years to do, we must now do in 20 years. Uh, I think that that space and time and the physical body and the planet and that everything is essentially some kind of an illusion. 
it's not real. What is real, what is truly bedrock, and I guess this comes close to being a Buddhist position, this is all provisional. This is not what the universe is. The universe is something else. You know, the Buddhists have a doctrine that uh, if a single person will attain enlightenment, then the illusion will collapse instantly. All beings will be sucked into the post-enlightenment state. And the illusion of space and time, of becoming an entity, will all be obviated at the snap of a finger. Well, we tend to disbelieve this because no matter how metaphysical we are, we may even call ourselves Buddhists, we really believe that Andromeda is 250,000 light years away. And we can't conceive of a light year, but we actually believe that what the scientists tell us. And yet, my God, when you start uh, when you start carrying all out a critique of modern science, you cannot believe what fluff this stuff is, is built on. I heard an analogy recently which I thought was very interesting. Our entire picture of the, dis- of the so-called distant universe is built up uh, by the science of radio telescopy, the use of radio telescopes to study deep space. This science has been in existence since about 1950. If you were to take all the radio signals that have been analyzed by uh, radio astronomy since 1950 and characterize them as energy, it would be the amount of energy that is released by a cigarette ash falling a distance of two feet. So this is the thinness of the data out of which we have created these incredibly uh, grandiose conceptions of what is happening. Uh, Science is just whistling past the graveyard. Don't forget that the telescope is about 500 years old this year. So to believe, you know, that that the story science tells us is true when we can't understand the mathematics, we cannot build the instruments ourselves, we cannot analyze the data. I mean, we are uh, under the thumb of a priesthood more uh, domineering, more removed from the ordinary concerns of ordinary people than any priesthood of any religion in the past ever was. I think we should hold all that um, in abeyance. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying it's not possible to tell whether it's true or not. One thing psychedelics will do for you, for sure, is to convince you that what's real is what I call the felt presence of immediate experience. That's what's real. You know, what you think, what you feel, what you see now is what's real. Even your own memories are so shifting and elusive and subject to psychological transformation based on your own inner and unconscious dynamics and kinks that to believe what somebody else is telling you about the temperature of basil juice or something like that or the charge of the top quark means you're just you've moved off into some kind of private Idaho. Crazy people <laughs> rave about stuff like this. But I think people who are rooted in uh, a good philosophical method will not give much credence to anything out of reach of their good right arm. And the psychedelic experience is an experience. No, I didn't present you with a set of tensor equations or a tape of, uh, of uh, electromagnetic data interpreted through the fiat of a fishy formula. We're talking experience here. And this experience, if made commiserate with ordinary experience, I think leads to the conclusion that 
this is, I said this the other night, um, this is as dead as you'll ever be. This is as low as you can go. This is as confined a mode of existence as it's possible to know. And it's all up from here, folks. It's a kind of Gnostic vision. Uh, it, it sees uh, our present circumstance as uh, the low rung of a ladder of transformational um, distillation. And, uh, you know, we come from we know not where. I mean, we have, yes, the details on the fertilization of the egg by the sperm and so forth and so on, but where the form comes from, we don't know. This is the mystery of morphogenesis. And then where the form goes to, we do not know. I mean, I, I now think that the proper way to think about biology is biological objects plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, amoebas, and human beings. Biological objects are hyperdimensional objects. You can tell that that's true because whenever you... What is the sine qua non of a biological object? Meaning, uh, what is the thing it must have to be biological? It must metabolize. That's the essence of life. The form is stable, but the matter and the energy which compose the form are in constant cycling. Uh, the form stabilizes, but the energy is flowing through it, which stabilizes it. Well, when we use phrases like cycling through it, flowing through it, these are words which imply a temporal dimension. If you have a chair, and you cut into it, it doesn't bleed, it doesn't squirm away, it doesn't begin to rot and fall over. If you cut into an, a, a living object, it undergoes all kinds of changes. This is because you have destroyed one of the dimensions necessary for its manifestation, the temporal dimension. The living body has a relationship to time which the chair doesn't have. The chair is born along in the stream of time. The biological object is made of time itself as much as it's made of space and matter. And so, really what birth is, is the descent of this mysterious entity called the form into matter. It clothes itself with matter and energy through a process of gestation, unfoldment, separation from the environment of gestation and unfoldment, which is the mother's body. And then it has an autonomous existence. But what is generally true of, true of all life in the phylogenetic, in the, I'm sorry, in the ontogenetic expression, what's true is that it has finite duration. Everything dies. The individual dinosaur, the individual elephant, the individual human being, they die. That means that the form eventually withdraws itself from the domain of matter and energy, and it then presumably exists as it existed before, having added whatever adumbrations three-dimensional experience has given to it. So I've come to see the body as basically the placenta of the soul. And, you know, that's a way of thinking about it that makes dying not so terrifying. I mean, it's as terrifying as smoking DMT, but it's nothing to claw the walls about. The body is the placenta of the soul for the individual well, then it's just a short step to realizing that we are now called upon as a species to abandon the body. The body uh, is the, the collective body is the collective placenta of the species. And you don't 
do a war dance around the placenta once it's served its function, which t is to bring the forming fetus to the point where it can exist and sustain itself in the dimension for which it is destined. In the case of ordinary birth, that's three-dimensional space and time. In the case of this metaphor, it's the hyperspace beyond space and time. Once we are ready to exist in that dimension, it's time to undergo the journey down the birth canal and bury the placenta under the old apple tree and forget it and move on. And, uh, you know, I grant you the, the analogy isn't perfect. I mean, where is the midwife? Where is the waving bassinet? But perhaps the answer to that is the midwife is waving in these intimations of the, of the friendly alien presence. It may be an aspect of humanness that awaits us just over the great divide. And so we are going to have to, uh, you know, I, I think that probably now at every talk I give, I make the analogy <coughs> to birth, that this is what we in the 20th century are experiencing. The 20th century is analogous to the birth canal of human history. And so, you know, the wonderful swim in the amniotic ocean is over. The, the fool's paradise of, of uh, the fetal life is ending. Now, the walls are literally closing in. We can't get enough oxygen. We're using up our food. The walls are strangling us. There's no room on this planet for all of us. And for us, it's a catastrophe. But I imagine when a woman goes into transition, that the fetus, if it's not a metaphysician, must be fairly aligned by the situation. He must just say, well, I guess this is it. It's all over. I'm going to be strangled, suffocated, and simultaneously <coughs> choked to death in this situation. It would take a far-seeing fetus indeed to embrace the journey down the birth canal as the road toward, uh, you know, a split-level ranch house in the hills <laughs> above Malibu if you play your cards right. <laughs> Surely that gets the idea across. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Could you say more about your the content of your experience? I was really fascinated. Um, and it seemed like there were some qualities to it that I wanted to know, hear more about. Well, uh, sure. Um, DMT, if you take it orally, is destroyed by enzymes in your gut, so it has to be smoked unless you have a chemical strategy for inactivating those enzymes. So assuming you smoke it, it comes on in about 30 seconds, and if you're a leather-lunged hashashin, you can maybe get it in one swell foot but it takes most people about three hits. And uh, the first thing you notice is that um, it's as though all the air has been drawn out of the room you're in. Suddenly the colors come forward and the edges sharpen. This is really happening. It has... Uh, an extraordinary effect at low doses on visual acuity. So does psilocybin. And then you close your eyes. You feel very peculiar. A kind of anesthesia sweeps through your body, a kind of numbing and yet a sense of a building bubble of energy. Uh, you close your eyes, and after a few seconds, you see forming in front of you 
what I call the chrysanthemum. It's a floral mandala, usually in yellow and orange, most people say. And it's, it's slowly turning, it's like a wall, but it's a hallucination, but it's right here, right in front of you. And you watch it for about 15 seconds. If it stabilizes, you need one more hit. But what usually happens is that after about 15 seconds of contemplating this thing, it's as though suddenly whatever was holding you back, the cable is cut, and you are just propelled through this membrane, and there is you hear a sound like a bread wrapper being crumpled, a cellophane bread wrapper being crumpled and thrown away, or the crackling of flames. This is, according to a friend of mine, your radio intellecti exiting the anterior fontanelle at the top of your head. <laughs> but he could be wrong. <laughs> but whatever it is, and then you hear a tone, which is, it could be reproduced on a synthesizer. It's that, you know, and, but it keeps going and becomes hypersonic, supersonic, subsonic, I don't know. Uh, and you, there is a sense of, um, literally, a membrane is ruptured, and now you're there. And what happens to me is, the first thing I hear is a cheer, a yell of greeting. It's... On, the, on their second album, the Pink Floyd have a song in which they sing, the, the gnomes have a new way to say hooray. <laughs> well, you break into this gnomeness, and it's a very specifically characterized place. It is domed, it's indirectly lit, not brightly lit, but it's softened lighting of some sort. It's comfortable, and but the but all of that is hard to focus on and relatively inconsequential because the main thing that's happening is these things come bounding towards you <coughs> like greyhounds, and there are many of them. These towards you <coughs> like greyhounds. And there are many of them. These jeweled you like greyhounds. And there are many of them. These jeweled you like greyhounds. An adventure out beyond the furthest boundary. I'll be searching for the spirit that can set me Power of the mystery. 
sort of had uh, something going before lunch. Can anybody remember what it was? Oh, well, I had a question. <laughs> it, it, was, it was the hallucinogenic snuff used by the Yanomami. Yeah, yeah and hadn't we done yeah, that? Yeah, we have done that. Let's not do that again. Are you still doing questions? <laughs> sure, yeah. I, I got one I'd like to pass around. The whole idea of uh, the shaman as having this hyperdimensional overview and as you say, some of them say it scares me shitless, even the top dog. Okay, and that, and that, and other times you, what you said, you, you wonder why it isn't in headlines 11 inches tall. There seems to be something about the experience that is, uh, I don't know if self-selecting is the right word or evolutionary selecting. Why isn't? Why aren't there? Why is there such a small percentage of people who actually end up, although you say everyone can do it, they do have the, the genetic possibility, but there's something more in the selective period that um, where a shaman will come out because it is, as you say, an awesome responsibility, and yet it's everyone's possible liberation. And then one, one last thing, uh, another coda to this. You, you mentioned that you don't think that it's the, the Bush or Reagan, etc., feeling that they just want to keep an economic grip as far as the, the sale of would-be hallucinogenic. Don't you think that there is some degree of teleological repression going on as well? I mean, you, you mentioned that, they, that, that you didn't feel that way, but I, I somehow, other times I've heard you feel that there definitely is. Well, I think that, yeah, I mean, it simplifies the issue to say that it's entirely a money issue. Right. Because the psychedelics are used by so small right. a percentage of people that it doesn't rate the tremendous <coughs> institutional fury that is brought against it and where you really see the contradiction in uh, economic logic is uh, with pot. Um, I think that the subtext of the government's fear about psychedelics is that the, this quality that they have of dissolving boundaries causes people to question basic assumptions about how society is run. And I think this is true of any society. It isn't an American phenomenon. It's that if you take psychedelics, whatever you are, you know, Eskimo, Hasidic rabbi, quantum physicist, you will question your first premises. And you get millions of people questioning the first premises, and uh, then the powers that be become very nervous. <coughs> it's interesting that the this whole phenomenon of the 1960s occurred because American commitment to universal public education reached, brought its first generation of people to adulthood in the middle of the 1960s because that universal commitment to public education began after World War II. After the establishment took a look at what this filling 
you know, actually funding and building up great public universities and then filling them with inquisitive uh, young people, what the result of that was, that's when they decided to turn the universities back into trade schools for CPAs, which they did do. I mean, there is nothing like the level and the breadth of education and intellectual curiosity that was encouraged when I was going to school. Uh, that's all finished now. Now you're expected to do your data entry job, watch a lot of TV, and keep your mouth shut. And that, this is what we expect of our college graduates. So really, there was a crisis of faith in American institutions which was only exacerbated by psychedelics. It was a combination of educating people to the actual traditions of Western civilization in large numbers for the first time, and then giving them psychedelics, I mean, or having them exposed to psychedelics, and people began to ask questions for which there were no answers. And the response of the establishment was to suppress this, I mentioned cannabis, you know, you're all probably aware through the work of the, the hemp uh, people that cannabis holds many benefits not necessarily related to its properties as an intoxicant, but as a source of food, lubricant, plastics, fuels, etc. The reason the establishment is so hysterical on the subject of cannabis is because it erodes loyalty to the industrial state. I mean, that's why, if you look at the pharmacological profile, let's contrast two familiar drugs. One, caffeine. We have the medical data which shows that it can contribute to fetal malformation. We know that it damages the liver. We know that it, uh, if abused, can cause uh, severe stomach ulcers, so forth and so on. <coughs> Cannabis, and vast amounts of money have been spent trying to find something wrong with it, and they're still digging, folks. I mean, they've decided it doesn't cause tits on statues. <laughs> it doesn't, uh, you know, all the screwy things they've come up with over the years. Uh, have had to be abandoned. Why is caffeine enshrined in l every labor contract negotiated in the Western world as a sacred right of all workers twice daily? And why is cannabis, uh, you know, you can lose your house, your automobile, your bank account, your art collection simply because you had six plants in the and back 40 and your children. Why are the, why this disparity. Well, what is the effect of caffeine? It uh, makes it possible for you to perform your duties during the last three hours of the work cycle with efficiency equal to the first three hours of the work cycle. It allows people to tolerate spinning widgets onto gombers until hell freezes over without a thought ever rising in their mind that maybe this is a ridiculous way to spend your life. <laughs> Cannabis, on the other hand, people aren't so interested in going to work. They'd rather lay around and make love. They don't want to watch TV. They'd rather smoke a doobie and have a conversation with a friend. It, it, in other words, these things promote activities which don't make anybody any money and cause people to question the institutions and the, and the uh, social philosophies that are being shoved down their throats. If the playing field were level, uh, caffeine might well be a prescription drug, not that I think that's a good idea, and uh, cannabis, I think, would probably be freely available. The most dangerous drugs in society in terms of detrimental social impact are alcohol and tobacco, the two most freely available. I mean, every street corner of every city, they're peddled uh, in vast amounts. We have a, a very crack-brained approach to the problem of drugs. We're not the only society. All societies seem to do this. 
out of a possible spectrum of 20 or 30 depressants and intoxicants, most societies select three or four, which they hail as harmless, and then the rest are, you know, the seed of Satan. <laughs> and this is this attitude is persevered in against all scientific data, against all medical research. This is just what people choose to think. The problem is we don't have the luxury of this kind of ignorance anymore. The amount of revenue that could be accrued from a uh, cannabis economy, the pressure that could be taken off petroleum extraction if cannabis were part of the picture, um, all of these things uh, make it incumbent upon us, I think, to think more creatively and more honestly about which drugs really are posing uh, problems for us. What was the first The other question really relates to this is why are there, given the fact, why, are, why is the <coughs> percentage of shamans so small relative to a population because of the fact that, as you say, there is fear in going into, there is attraction and fear in going into these other realms. And there's obviously maybe some self-limiting aspect of the uh, of the hyper-dimensional uh, view, which there's some dynamic going on because everyone has an equal opportunity to go to this hyper-dimensional, but very few of their own initiative really push to that point where you are definitely within the hyper-dimensional realm. Well, there are different things to be said about this. I mean, first of all, um, one of there are what are called uh, biochemical differences in individuality uh, and never more so than in the matter of drugs uh, people are very different from each other years ago I took a course from Sasha Shogun um, at Cal and uh, at one point he brought in some substance, I don't know what it was, and this was a class of 600 people, and passed it around and asked everybody to take a sniff of this bottle. Well, 598 people pronounced this stuff completely odorless. Two people were pr almost violently ill from the overpowering odor of this thing. They possessed a gene for the sensitivity to this compound that caused it to be for them overwhelming, for everyone else unnoticeable. And we're surrounded by these kinds of individual biochemical differences. In traditional societies, shamanism is often a family business and it may well be that this is because ability to handle these psychedelic substances uh, and to really get mileage out of them is a genetic endowment of some sort. I mean, cannabis, again, it provides an interesting example. One of the commonest things you hear people say about cannabis who don't smoke it is they say, I, I used to where I tried it, but it makes me paranoid. Uh, well, uh, it, to the people who use it, this is inconceivable. <laughs> In fact, it's almost an antidote to paranoia uh, because it seems to make things appear more Taoistic, more integrated. It all makes more sense. These are biochemical differences that need to be studied. You know, different racial groups have different relationships to intoxication. I mean, I think it's probably there is some truth to the idea that the North American Indians had a susceptibility to distilled alcohol that the Europeans, who had been dealing with it for a couple of centuries by the time they arrived here, didn't have because the North American Indians represented a, uh, a closed gene pool never having been exposed to this there was no selection for being able to handle it uh, and then there's another issue in 
relation to your question, John, which is, first of all, you know, some people say, well, not all shamans take hallucinogens. Well, true, and I've excited some people's ire by suggesting, but all real shamans <laughs> do. And, uh, you know, saying that somebody is a shaman, I mean, imagine if simply being able to rave and exhort on the subject of the four Gospels qualified you as a man of the Lord. Uh, actually, you have to sort through dozens of so-called preachers to find somebody you would be willing to leave alone with your chickens. Well, similarly, uh, you have to sort through a lot of uh, people who claim to be shamans before you find somebody who really is one. I mean, if we tend to be naive. Go to the Amazon with your heart on your sleeve seeking ayahuasca, and I guarantee, unless you go well-connected, you'll drink a lot of swill before you get to somebody honest enough, responsible enough, conscientious enough to actually make it right and do it right. And in, in the case of shamanism, usually this is going on in <coughs> cultures without literacy, without written languages, and, and so they don't hold conferences or publish proceedings or have the university uh, matriculation examinations in shamanism. So on the surface, a shaman is anyone who claims to be a shaman or who cares to claim. But I, in terms of uh, real shamanic ability, I think it only comes through either innate special abilities, which probably means innate high sensitivity to neurological, um, to neurotransmitters, exotic neurotransmitters, or it comes through an exposure to hallucinogens. Uh, this is a big argument in anthropology. Merci Eliad, who normally I am very deferent to, got this one completely wrong and decided on absolutely no evidence that what he called narcotic shamanism was decadent. Well, first of all, the use of the word narcotic in that context shows that he didn't know what he was talking about. <coughs> Nobody uses narcotics to shamanize. You go to sleep if you take narcotics. So. What he wanted to say was that he felt hallucinogenic shamanism was decadent, but what is the alternative? Reliance on ordeals, fasting, or pathological personalities, maybe epileptics or uh, borderline schizophrenics or something like that. I think the, that these kinds of shamanisms that are not hallucinogenically based are derivative shamanisms that occur at a later stage of culture when the, the uh, plant-based shamanism has been disrupted by some, some uh, factor like migration or the disappearance of the plants involved or something like that. Yeah. From what I understand, uh, the Lakota Indians didn't use hallucinogenics. They uh, accomplished all of this through, you know, uh, the drum beat and the song and, and things like that. And to this day, if you talk to the Lakota about the use of hallucinogenics as far as their shamans go, they say it's not necessary. And yet in the Southwest, in the Southwest, you know, it's prominent. And yeah, well, right you, on, you I sort think of, acoustical, sort of uh, here, acoustical know. driving can carry you a certain distance. There are substitutes for hallucinogens, but they're n neither as effective nor as uh, pleasant. I mean, ordeals are what many cultures get into. Well, I was just thinking, you know, along the lines of, you know, someone like Crazy Horse who came out of the Lakota who seemed to 
possess these you know, abilities uh, and manifest them physically. Well, there's also the exceptional personality. The exceptional personality breaks all the rules, see. But, um... So would you say, would you say then, um, Terrence, that there is a genetic proclivity, maybe in some individuals, if there is access to um, botanicals, and if the, there is no uh, historical evidence of shamanism prior to that, for that individual to start engaging in explorations? Yeah, I think so. You know, Maria Sabina claimed that she was never initiated into shamanism. She claimed that as a girl herding the cattle, she ate the mushrooms because she was hungry, and that she was basically self-taught in shamanism in a society that actually had shamanic uh, lineages and institutions. Uh, in Madagascar, there are these highly evolved uh, ordeal poisons, and this is where you take a, you take a plant, it, you feel like you're dying, you beg to die, you want to die, and you don't die. You come back from it a better person, but it is only because you were slammed up against death itself. Ordeals work but they're not very pleasant. And the idea of putting yourself through an ideal like that once a week or twice a month <laughs> as part of your professional practice is, is, uh, is pretty outrageous. The other thing that has to be said, and this is really important, and I think anthropologists have sold this one short, experiences are what we are least able to communicate to each other. We can describe machine parts, agricultural procedures, but anything in the realm of feeling, our languages are woefully impoverished, and I don't think that's specific to English. I think it, it haunts all human experience, that it's hard to communicate how we feel. Well, so then there's a vast spectrum of experiences that come from plants uh, and I dare say most of them unpleasant uh, let's start out with uh, eating Diefenbachia or something you know which causes your throat tissues to swell up and you feel like you're strangling or uh, uh, you know Amanita muscaria is a very controversial a pl shamanic plant because some people say it's garbage and Gordon Wasson in his last book called it the supreme entheogen of all time well uh, clearly people are are they talking about different things or are they interpreting the same experience differently uh, and so there are, uh, for example you know people who are fond of peyote like if they haven't done their homework like to imagine that they are taking this ancient, ancient hallucinogen that has informed the lives of the of the Sonoran and and uh, the Indians of that area for thousands and thousands of years. Well, this is, as far as anybody can tell, complete bunk. Uh, there is no record of peyote use. Uh, older than four or five hundred years. Most of it is post ghost dance. Before, it, when you go into the old Sonoran graves, the old archaeology of the Sonoran, the Tarahumara Indians, you find Sakura Secunda, uh, yes, yeah, beans, the little uh, black and red beans that you see in Mexico strung into jewelry sold along the side of the roads. That's what those Indians took for thousands and thousands of years. We have a continuous record over about 4,000 years of these seeds being buried in graves with uh, ritual instruments indicating that they were buried with shamans. You couldn't give it away today. 
because it is such a horrible experience. It's essentially sub sublethal strychnine it poisoning. It can kill you effortlessly. It's clear that at some point, fairly recently, somebody tried peyote and said, my God, this stuff we've been taking for thousands and thousands of years is just horrible compared to this. This is great. <laughs> and immediately there was a transfer of loyalty. And Lord knows, eating fresh peyote is no gourmet undertaking. <laughs> so the point there being, cultures tend to um, define experiences differently and you can't tell what people are talking about until you really check in uh, traveling around the world you know you all you end up in certain cultures and they say oh we're so happy to have you here um, as our honored guest we would like you to eat uh, some of our national food let's say you're in Scotland and so they say, well, you must eat some huggies because uh, this is what we all eat. We all really love this. This is the best part of Scottish life. Mm -mm, boy, are you going to love this. Well, when it's finally served, you know, your jaw drops in disbelief uh, because it's ghastly unless you're Scotch. And... Well, but if you're Scotch, you dare not say so, you see, because a cultural myth has been built up around. I mean, do Italians knock red wine? Do the French denounce truffles? Uh, certainly not. Uh, ah, true. <laughs> Pâté de foie gras is always my uh, example of this. So what you have to realize is that these things are culturally defined and often what works for the Yanomamo or the Muinani or the Witoto won't work for you. Datura is a good example. Datura is a shamanic plant used by many people throughout uh, the world. All of them, I think, pharmacologically deprived Otherwise, they wouldn't put up with what you have to put up with to take that stuff, you know. And uh, my interest, and I you know it was practical, was to find a hallucinogen that did what I wanted it to do and didn't do anything I didn't want it to do. And what I was interested in was, first of all, hallucinations, because... Some people say I'm obsessed with it. Fine. My notion is that if you can see something that isn't there, that's very much more convincing than just funny thoughts, racing ideas, strange physical sensations. It's a powerful and boundary-dissolving confrontation when you confront what is not there. And so I find, and this is a heresy for sure, I, I'm not that fond of LSD. I think it's a very sloppy drug. I, I think, you know, you feel terrible the next day. I always did. I had tight headaches, body aches. People always say, well, it was not clean. It had speed in it. It had strychnine in it. Eh, maybe. But even the good stuff is not, uh, and it wouldn't hallucinate for me the way I wanted it to. I could get hallucinations if I would smoke hash with it, but on its own, it was what I have described in other places as abrasively psychoanalytic, unpleasant, confrontational, and what I was interested in were hallucinations. So when I got to psilocybin, I remember after my first mushroom trip, I said, thank God we found this stuff. I'll never take LSD again. That wasn't quite true, but I'll bet I've taken it less than half a dozen times since my first psilocybin trip. So, uh, and, and in terms of the chemistry of these things, my conclusion from all this fiddling is that it's the indole hallucinogen that are at the center of the mandala. They do what we want 
them to do with very little detrimental side effect. LSD is one of them. Uh, Ebogaine is one of them. Not one widely known. we got to save something for our old age, folks. Uh, <laughs> harmine and harmaline, the beta-carbolines, uh, when complexed with DMT, and then psilocybin, and I think that's the basic list. Well, those do... They, these are really the keys which open the lock very easily, very cleanly, very uh, dependably. And that's where I would put all of my attention. And, you know, even in that domain, you have to be somewhat uh, careful. My brother and I spent years tracking down a hallucinogen in the Amazon called Ukuhe that... Uh, was an orally active form of DMT, which we remember I said that DMT is destroyed in the gut. So we were fascinated to try and find this ukuhe because we wanted to know how it was possible that it could work orally. And also the ethnographic accounts claimed that uh, the people who used it spoke with little men. And we wanted to see these little men, to see if they were the same little men we were trying to. Well, (laughs) we had three expeditions to the Amazon before we finally closed in on this stuff. And when we finally got it, you know, with this tremendous sense of having attained the grail and having finally this was going to do it, this was going to be the one. Then we took this stuff. And my God, it turned us every way but loose. Your heart feels like it's pounding its way out of the front of your chest. You vomit. Uh, You have tremoring of the limbs. On and on and on. So we go through this, live through it, wash off in the river and go looking for the shaman to lodge a complaint <laughs> and, uh, and he says yeah well it's hard to get used to and uh, so then when we get it back home to the lab and do the high pressure gas chromatography and all the rest of it and see what's really there you see that the genetic component of the varola trees from which this resin is extracted is it's a mess it's too many tryptamines DMT DET 5 monomethyl tryptamine 5 MAO DMT and several other cardioactive tryptamines it looked like they'd swept the floor of an indol chemist's lab to put together the components of this plant you don't want this you don't, because you're, it's like taking ten drugs at once. You know, it's all running together. You can't tell whether you're Agnes or Angus. What you want is uh, a, a DMT source where when you put it in the grass, in the uh, grass chromatograph, no, in the uh, gas chromatograph, <laughs> you get one spike. That's nn dimethyltryptamine and all the rest is cellulose, a little DNA, and that's all, some minerals and salt. Uh, if, if you don't have a clean source, then, you know, it's contaminated. So even that legendary shamanic hallucinogen, uh, when actually put to the, to the uh, use test, wasn't able to, to pass it. Yeah. Yes, uh, going back to the DMT and uh, mushroom psilocybin, um, you were talking about uh, taking psilocybin and then doing breath control is indistinguishable from a DMT trip. If you do it correctly, you can coax it. Um, Since this is a learning tree and you're sort of in front there, maybe you could give us an idea of what it's like to coax five grams into an... uh, I mean, I'm sure you won't be able to give us all the information, but maybe you can 
sort of enlighten us a little bit and we can sort of work in that direction. At least I can work in that direction. Well, you mean how do you get at the peak of a psilocybin trip to deliver you into DMT land? Yes, because sometimes I get a little jealous hearing you talk about DMT <laughs> trip. And I sit here and say, uh, you know, I want to find that stuff. And you know, Anyway, so... Well, the thing is... Psilocybin will take you there if you have the courage and the stamina to tolerate the duration of, of the psilocybin revelation. Thank so you. first of all, you take a heroic dose, five, six, seven grams. Then, when you're peaking, uh, well, you smoke cannabis. Mm -hmm. Then. You, you sit in silent darkness alone because I think the presence of other people always pins you to the surface right. with this stuff. I mean, you don't need somebody else. There. No matter if they're talking or not, they can just be in no, the room just, and you're aware of that. just them. sitting there, yeah. then this is a different thing. Yeah. Uh, breathing, breathing, exhaling, breathing, exhaling. And then you form an intention for it to approach you. I mean, you say, I can feel it. I mean, it's almost a, it's a neighborhood. It's a pharmacological neighborhood. And, and you know how you may go to Little Italy, but there are no Italians on the street. But if you start, uh, you know, you have to somehow shake them out of the nest. and. It, you simply ask for them to appear. I always hark back to that episode of I Love Lucy where she and Ethel are discussing how to contact the space people and Lucy tells Ethel, she says, well, I just say, come in, little green man, come in, <laughs> little green man. And yeah, yeah, it's a big laugh now, but try it on 25 milligrams of DMT thing is uh, these entities which you contact, although they may turn out to be toys created by someone unseen who is in fact in charge of this hyperdimensional maternity ward. But these toys, if that's what they are, are essentially teaching machines of some sort. They're trying to get you to perform this linguistic activity. As far as the UFO thing is concerned, I think it's... Uh, well, it sort of requires some backgrounding. I think that uh, there's something fundamentally wrong with our understanding of the world fundamentally wrong. And what it is, is that we believe that the past creates the present. That the present is the, is the sum total of actions and situations that exist in the past. In other words, we believe that the horse pushes the cart. The horse doesn't push the cart. The cart is pulled. There is an attractor in the future. There is actually, uh, I think of history as a bowl. Down the slope, we are making our way. Well, since we are uh, in, a, in a situation where conservation of energy is important, where are we all going to end up? The bottom of the bowl, obviously. That's release a marble up on the rim, it's going to make its way down the bowl 
to the what's called the dwell point, the place where uh, the energy requirements are such that the forward momentum of, of the falling ball is satisfied by meeting the resistance of the bottom of the bowl. History is like this. We are being pulled forward by an attractor. It has somehow come into the human world and has pulled us out of animal organization. If this attractor were not present, we would still probably be cheerfully slinging excrement around in the canopy of some jungle tree. But because of the attractor, we have been pulled into social organization, technology, language, community, so forth and so on, and um, mystics and seers and visionaries are people who have a relationship to this attractor that is different from the rest of us. They can uh, glimpse aspects of this thing. And when I think of it this way, I, I always think of those jewel, the, the mirrored ball that they hang over the bar in a disco and then they spin it and it throws reflections of light all over the room from the ambient lighting. Well, history is like this. Uh, the attractor at the end of time, which is below the event horizon of the present and thus impossible to anticipate its true form, uh, sends back through time distorted reflections of itself, which if you are struck by one of these distorted reflections, well, then you begin to preach and cure, and local conditions may damp your activity, and then you're what's called a nut. But if, in fact, local conditions support your activity so that you become a mean spreader, then you're suddenly a messiah, a teacher, a Buddha, a Christ, a Mohammed. That's what these people were. They were people who were, for reasons mysterious to themselves, I'm sure, in a relationship of resonance with the transcendental object, such that they, in a sense, embodied it. Well, um, in our own era, because of technology, and Jung was on to this when he wrote his book in 1948 called Flying Saucers, a Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. He said, the flying saucer is an image of the self that is, uh, haunts the skies of Earth as a compensatory effect to our alienation. Well, I think that that's exactly what's going on, except that he didn't realize how nuts and bolts that explanation was. The UFO is a mirage being cast backward into time by the transcendental object at the end of time. And that's why it has such a hair-raising aura of weirdness about it. It isn't a ship from another star system. I mean, how could anyone reasonably entertain that idea given the distances in time and what you find when you get here? I mean, who would make that trip who had any reasonable uh, way to spend their time? It's, uh, it's a uh, compensatory image that haunts time because time is a kind of hologram. Time is a fractal. And fractal means that the same pattern is embedded. And fractal means that the same pattern is embedded. And fractal means that the same pattern is embedded. And fractal means that the same pattern is embedded. 
and fractal means that the same pattern in one of these things. I, I was at that one with Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> these things, it's it's got humor behind it. I mean, it's a, it's a, a grand silliness of some sort. I'm willing to be proven wrong. I grappled with it like everybody else for six months, but the density of flakiness around it is incredible. And the number of people whose private agendas are being served by this. I mean, if it were happening north of Hudson Bay, there'd be no money in it. You have to be able to drive there from central London in, for it, in order for it to work. Well, then people always say, well, but it's happening all over the world, my good man. Haven't you heard? Show me. Show me. It's not happening all over the world. Some clumsy attempts appeared in Kentucky. And you know, there was something in Germany. And so forth and so on. But in it, it, the... It's really hair-raising to be among these people and to see how uncommitted to, to finding out what it is they are and how totally committed they are to preserving it from rational inspection. They don't want to talk about you know, any alternative other than whatever the pet theory of the week is about how it's happening. Now, I see it as part of the ingression into novelty. Things are going to get weirder and weirder. There's no doubt about that. But it doesn't mean that there are, is uh, a conscious extraterrestrial agency. I mean, I find it pretty weird that there are 500 women who think they have fetuses <laughs> removed from their bodies by extraterrestrials. That's so <laughs> weird that suggesting that it's true seems a little like overkill to me. I mean, what is going on that would make a woman uh, uh, do that sort of thing? <laughs> There's always, if you're, a, if you're a careful observer of one of these things, there's always, Jacques Vallée wrote about this, a residuum of absurdity that is suppressed by the witness because the witness knows that if they told the whole story, their story is not credible. This is called, you know, the built-in absurdity of these paranormal things. And when somebody tells you a story about a UFO encounter that does not have this element of self-contradicting absurdity in it, they're manipulating the evidence to make it seem more woo-woo-woo, I think. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a rationalist except, uh, well, I've seen things that violated the laws of physics. I believe the laws of physics can be violated. I believe there may well be extraterrestrials somewhere in the universe. Do you believe the Voynich manuscripts may have something to do with the, some type of alien intelligence? No, I think the Voynich manuscript is a solved problem and that this guy, Leo Levertov's translation is correct found was, you know, it was a Catharite manual for the dying. That's much more exciting than trying to claim it as a book from another dimension, because now we gain an insight into what Catharism was really about. I think there is a residuum of the irrational and the paranormal, but these things, like flying saucers and Atlantis and, uh, and the crop circles, they're like viruses upon the healthy body of language. You know, there's something wrong with language and communication uh, because it's never as you imagine it's going to be. And people are being sold a phenomenon that if they were to go, they would discover that aspects of it were suppressed or misrepresented. The people who are dealing with the cross circles are having a great time. It's the longest drinking party on record in that part of England. I guess I should say this, because I know it's a bummer to have your favorite uh, 
weird thing dumped on. <coughs> but my technique, which I recommend to you, is don't believe anything. If you believe in something, you are automatically precluded from believing its opposite. Therefore, you have given up a portion of your freedom, and freedom is the dearest thing we've got. You don't have to believe anything. You can just provisionally work your way through stuff. So, And then, probe the edges. The, the, the edges will satisfy. Uh, I, I think that the proper way to contact the other is with hard-headed rationalism exercised under weird conditions. I went to India, visited some of these yoga people and accomplished saints. I'm telling you, for my money, it was hokum. It's, it was, there was an ulterior agenda, either having the wish to relieve you of your cash or to violate some body cavity. Uh, that was the ulterior agenda. When I went to the Amazon with the same attitude of skepticism and talked to the shamans there, they delivered the goods. If somebody... So you just, you just investigate these things, and the key question is, what can you show me? If they've got it, they can show it. There's no mumbo-jumbo around the real thing. But if they say, oh, well, you know, uh, the tape recordings miraculously erased themselves last night, or... We'll show you, but you have to sweep up around the ashram for a dozen years to prove you're worthy. Or, you know, you are not worthy. That's the one where you head for the door. You are not worthy. Uh, the real thing is the real thing, for crying out loud. It can be displayed. It doesn't require this weird fuzzy relationship of worth and insight and so forth and so on and I and that's how I got to psychedelics psychedelics work if you think that I'm bullshitting you go home and take five grams of mushrooms in silent darkness and then we'll talk that's the sine qua non but uh, it, it'll work on demand I'm not saying, and wait 40 years, or purify yourself, or fix, get your aura stitched up, or any of the rest of it. It'll work. It'll blow your mind to shreds. It's real. This other stuff is just, you know, all these gurus, they need to find honest work. They need to join the rest of us in contemplating the mystery of reality. They don't know what they're talking about. If they knew what they were talking about, they wouldn't have to shuffle the deck when you're out of the room. And that's what's going on. Somebody must be outraged and insulted <laughs> and terribly disappointed. Yeah. yeah getting back to the DMT. You have the same experience each time you take it under similar conditions. Do other people report the same things, the same teaching machines? And how does it relate to your death experience? On the other side. In order. Yes, I do have the same experience each time I take it. Did they say nice to see you again? They say you've sent so many that you come so rarely. And then the more interesting question, do, do other people see it? Yeah, do I get a commission? Uh, do other people see it? What I've, I've thought about this question a lot because it's a question of communication. If they saw it, could they tell me? If they told me in their language, would I understand what they were telling me? And what I've decided is that the, the experience is an archetype. It's the archetype of the circus. Why? 
don't ask me why. I don't know why. But, for instance, I've listened to many, many people talk about their DMT experiences, and inevitably, this is the box into which it will fit. I gave it to a woman once up in Washington, uh, an anthropologist. It was a sub-threshold dose because she coughed. I could tell she didn't get it. And when she came down, she said, it was the saddest carnival I've ever been to. She said there were no, the rides weren't open. The tents were shuttered and there were little gum papers blowing between the, between the things, uh, the stands. The circus is an interesting archetype because it has a number of facets. First of all, you have the three central rings under the big top. That's the dome. Uh, and in the central ring, there's light and color and clowns. Remember that Maria Sabina called the mushrooms the little clowns. Uh, and these clowns, uh, the circus is for children. And when you take DMT, one of the things I didn't mention in my description of it is you have a peculiar impression of your own body geometry. Your head seems to be very large in relationship to your torso. You are, in fact, an infant in some sense. You become a child. This leads to thinking about the 52nd fragment of Heraclitus, which says the aeon is a child that play with colored balls. Nobody knows what this saying means, but it's persisted for about 3,000 years, so it must mean something. But outside the three rings, there's another aspect to the circus. It is spun into eros because above the center ring and up near the top of the dome is the beautiful woman in, with long blonde hair and the tiny skimpy spangled costume and very complicated narrative type dream and the alarm rings and by the time your feet hit the floor and you stagger into the shower it's gone it's not partially gone it's all gone. And all you can say is, I was having this amazing dream. I, I have no idea what it was. The DMT thing can leave you just that quickly. And also, and I think this has a bearing on this, they have studied the production of DMT in normal metabolism, and it peaks in normal human beings between 3 and 4 a.m., this is when the deep dreaming is going on. This is when the intense REM states are being experienced. So I think that where the dead and the living get together is in the dream time. Australian Aborigines have been trying to tell us this for as long as we would listen. Uh, and also, a lot of people, it, it's it's possible to repress it very, very quickly. I think, for instance, I've seen people, one way you can tell if someone has really gotten a good DMT trip is they lay down, they become very still, but if you look closely at their face with their eyes closed, you can see that their eyes are moving wildly underneath their closed eyelids. This is because they're in, in REM state, and they are watching the, the whatever it is they're seeing. They are looking at it. I, I remember giving DMT to a person years and years ago, a person who might have been a candidate for the description psychologically fragile. And it was clear that she got it because she was a hash smoker and she took three or four enormous hits, laid down, her eyes were wildly rotating around in her head. When she came out of it, said, what was it? Said, it was nothing. I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything at all. And furthermore, 
I don't think I want to have anything more to do with you. <laughs> and didn't. Well, I think that, that this is something that you, it only shows as much of it as you can stand. And some of us cannot stand much at all. This, is, this occurs with psilocybin as well. I've had experiences with psilocybin where I've said to it, after hours of hallucinations of one sort or another, I finally say, you know, what I'm really interested in is your true essence. Can you show me what you are for yourself rather than for me? What are you for yourself? Well, then it's just like a cold wind blows through and black velvet curtains begin to rise. And after 30 seconds of this, you just say, uh, that's enough of what you are for yourself. Because you can tell it's headed in a direction you can't tolerate at all. You can't stand. I have a friend who said of psilocybin, he said, my goal every time I take it is to stand more of what it really is. And this is why it's incredibly kind to beginners. Beginners basically need have no fear if they will regulate the dose reasonably because it wants to recruit you. And so it says, you know, here it is, whatever you wanted, aliens, outer space, elves, erotic imagery, here it is. Doesn't this feel safe? See, we're not so bad. We're your friends. We're not like all the others. Come back soon. It's after you gain familiarity with it, where it says, you know, there are aspects to me that we've never really talked about. Say, oh, yeah? Like what? Well, like this. Oh. No, no. Let's go back to the Disney loop. <laughs> How close is the uh, DMT that you smoke um, compared to the brain DMT that we all have running through? Um, is there different, like NN dimethyltryptamine, and what's in our brain? Can no, no, it's the same thing. Exactly the same. It's the same thing. DMT uh, it occurs in two forms: the salt and the hydrochloride, and uh, and uh, both forms occur. Well, no, I'm not sure that both forms occur in metabolism, but the only difference is that one is water-soluble and the other isn't. So basically, then again, we are whole. Then I mean, if it's if DMT is illegal, then what we have in our brain running through us is considered illegal. Yeah, we are potentially bustable. You know, in light of what I said, one of the most interesting frontiers that the New Age has brought forward that I think bears more serious study than the channelings of Amenhotep's barber and all that, uh, is lucid dreaming. Yeah. Lucid dreaming, if it... I, I don't know whether those people... I don't know those people personally. I don't know what their motivation is. But if it's true that you can take control of the dream state, then this would be something worth spending even a lot of time on. Because uh, the dream state is more like the tryptamine geography than anything else. One of the most fascinating things about DMT that should certainly be mentioned, as long as we're exhausting ourselves on this subject, mm. is uh, <coughs> once you've had DMT, once you've smoked it and this experience has occurred, you can have a dream years later in which you're with a bunch of people and something's going on and you enter the atrium of the Hotel California and you take a floor to the basement or something, and then you're in a room with people and someone whips out a little glass pipe and you smoke it and it happens. It doesn't sort of happen. It happens. A hundred percent. That means that's exciting data because that means that we have the wherewithal to trigger this experience in ourselves on the natch at least while we're asleep and I presume that with sufficient patience and subtlety 
and biofeedback equipment, and I don't know what you would take, but if you spend a million dollars, you could probably deliver it on time. Mm -hmm. uh, we can trigger this most intense of all hallucinogenic ecstasies, most boundary dissolving of all possible human experiences, on the Natch. But we have to somehow find our way to the button. And apparently, in normal waking consciousness, it isn't there. I spend a lot of time, I mean, I didn't mean to be so flip about the UFOs. I've spent years trying to think about the UFOs and studied all the theories. One that I still may be part of the truth is maybe it is so that we generate and sequester DMT somewhere in our brain and under unusual situations, this sequestered DMT can suddenly be dumped into the brain fluid or into the bloodstream, and then you have a DMT experience or some kind of quasi-DMT-like experience. Because I read an interesting paper a few years ago. I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it. It was an anthropological paper. It was called The Felt Presence in Unusual Environments. And it talked about how it is apparently a basic trait of human beings to win in the wilderness, especially unfamiliar wilderness. People sense something there the felt presence in unusual environments. Well, it may be that... Um, now, imagine if you're in the wilderness in a situation not entirely familiar to you so that you're edging up toward this felt presence thing and suddenly DMT stored in your brain is for some reason, uh, perhaps a pathological reason that it uh, shouldn't happen, but it's shunted into your brain. Well, now, suddenly, you feel there's something here. There's someone here. There's someone with me. The hair on the back of your neck stands up. And then you see coming toward you a disturbance in your perceptual field. Now, you're supposed to be alone. There isn't supposed to be a disturbance in your perceptual input. But there is you are alarmed. It may be dangerous. You must identify what this is. Well, every one of us carries around inside us a cultural inventory of what weird events might possibly be. If you're a medieval peasant farming the hills of Tuscany and this happens, you immediately conclude that it's the Virgin or it's an angel. And lo and behold, as it comes closer, it clothes itself in heavenly raiment, and it is the Virgin. And so you are encountering the Virgin. Well, now, what if you're a Southern California steeped in the religious faiths of Malibu, and this happens to you? You will conclude, my God, it's a UFO. I mean, haven't you been with people who every airplane that flies over they're willing to proclaim is an extraterrestrial intervention? It's because this explanation lies very close to the surface. When we don't know what something is, we want to know, we want to English it, we want to name it, and we grasp the nearest thing at hand. It's very important to avoid this reflex in order to see what is it really? What is it really? Let it be what it is. Yeah. Uh, four small points on that one. I noticed I did a book in 73 on the flat of the dark And I interviewed perhaps 500 people. And in a large number, they start with a, it's a traditional poetic to a note, it's called negative parallelism, where you identify, negate, identify, negate. So you start, it looks like a low flying plane. No, it was too low. It looked like a semi with its out of order lights on. And only as the third or fourth identification, which is traditional to classic tropes of the 13th century, would they identify it as my God, it's a UFO. Point one. Uh, another one, the strangest one was 
an old lady in Texas, and I said, how did you know it was a UFO? And she said, because it had UFO printed on the undercarriage. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, next one was a judge. I went down to Pascagoula with the Hickson and Parker. Famous so case. I've got to see them again because I want to see how they've done over there. Very interesting case. And the judge and the clerk of courts and two other people were riding home during that period, and two of them in the car saw a UFO and the others couldn't see it. So let's say one saw it because of a DMT drop of some kind. Another was his clerk and decided he'd better see it. And the other two were just straight. <laughs> um, la last point. Um, there's a guy called Orfeo Angelucci, oh, yeah. who was an early contactee, who uh, gave me a useful handle on kind of talk about working the edges. He was out and he met the captain of the ship, and the ship's captain said during the interview, would you go and get me a bottle of soda pop? And then they went on with their event. So I began looking for what I called the soda pop factor. You know, that's where there was an element or more than one element absolutely unrelated to the story. That was somehow a, a touch of human... Uh, An intrusion. Intrusion, yeah. Uh -huh. Unnecessary intrusion. Well, let me say one thing about it. You don't even have to be cynical to the point of believing in the Pascagoula situation that the second guy saw the UFO because he was the clerk. These uh, drug molecules have, uh, uh, free, have resonant rings. They are aromatics. It may be that there's a pheromone thing happening here and that a state of mind can be transferred to one per from one person to another through body odor. Uh, this may be how the states of telepathy are achieved um, on psilocybin, because you do smell funny, and this smell may be more than funny, it may be carrying uh, information. There's a very interesting phenomenon that is well documented called allophrenia. Do you all know what allophrenia is? Allophrenia is when a friend of yours gets put in the hospital for schizophrenia and you, being a good Samaritan, decide to take them a box of candy and during the visit to your friend you behave so bizarrely that you don't get to leave the hospital. <laughs> Allophrenia. <laughs> schizophrenic behavior on the part of non-schizophrenics in the presence of schizophrenics. I've experienced this. I had a friend, I visited him in the hospital, and, and the way, here's how it works, it's really interesting. <laughs> I, I visited my friend in the hospital. He was nutty as a fruitcake. But he was my friend, and he was talking 90 to nothing, so I wanted to communicate with him. So instead of saying to every single statement he made, I don't understand you, you're nuts, that makes no sense whatsoever, I began trying to agree with him, trying to understand him, and then it sort of got the momentum of a game going where he would say, you know, I'm really Sir Han, Sir Han. And I would say, yes, but your teacup is on backwards. And a doctor walking into this situation would have a hard time telling who's nuts and who's not. Well, was that because I decided to play along with him? Or why did I decide? There was an ambiance that gave permission for erratic, irrational, peculiar behavior. And I suppose if you were borderline schizophrenic in that situation, that's all it would take to, to push you over the edge. Do you think, I, I know you're probably thinking about that Wiener's ECM stuff. Yeah. You told me about it yourself. But I, I find I just recently read all those papers uh, again. And I think you're really right that there is some uh, sub- well, it's what he calls the olfactory subconscious, that there is perception below what is olfactorily normally perceived. And this is profound uh, information transformation, uh, messages that are perceived and stuff. Yeah, I think that there could be something to it. Yeah, people who study human behavior have noted that when a person enters a room full of people, 
unconsciously, the first thing they do is they take a deep breath. What that's doing is giving you a whole bunch of information. And you can tell, you can say, I walked into the room and the vibes were terrible because Herbert had just slugged Alice uh, three minutes before and everybody was freaking out about it. Or I just walked into the room and I could tell something weird was happening, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And what it was was Alice and Fred heard me coming, so he took his hand out of her blouse as I opened the door. This kind of thing. In other words, information that is coming in through the olfactory senses. There are psychiatrists who diagnose schizophrenia by what they call the sniff test. You know, this is one of the most subtle and difficult of all mental dysfunctions to diagnose. And some people just lean over your anterior fontanelle and take a hit and say, him to therapy, her to release, and him to medication. Because they are confident enough that the smell will do it. There's even one theory of schizophrenia that holds that what schizophrenia is, is a... Uh, a dysfunctional pheromone system so that y you who are the schizophrenic your real problem is that you smell funny not stink people aren't aware of that but it's that there's something about you that causes people to treat you strangely and you reacting to being treated strangely by people get weirder and they reacting to you getting weirder treat you more and more strangely so what you have here is a feedback cycle that ends with nets being dropped over you and you taken away but the original <laughs> cause was that there was uh, you were giving off a chemical which made people treat you in a way that caused you to react to them adversely and that started the cycle going. Or, or they say that you perceived olfactory hallucinations. Not that you just smelled weirdly, but that you perceived... Oh, that you were misinterpreting incoming That's right. There's olfactory a whole section that talks about olfactory hallucinations. The reason we're talking so much about this is because if you look at these pheromone molecules and lay them next to these drug molecules, it's all one family. These are all small, planar molecules. There's even one area where it comes together pretty spectacularly. That is, in the pineal gland of human beings, there's a great deal of, uh, like, something like 12% um, uh, of the brain's energy is being channeled into the pineal gland. Well, if you know anything about evolutionary theory, you know that you don't waste energy in unnecessary functions or you become extinct. So there's a reason why 12% of the brain's energy is being channeled into the pineal gland, though we don't know what it is. Well, then when you look at what's going on in the pineal, uh, uh, a, neuro, a neuro compound called adenoroglomerotropane is being transduced by light into melatonin. Well, this compound, adenoroglomerotropine, in ordinary biochemical nomenclature, is 6 methoxy tetrahydrohalan. It's a near relative of the compounds in the ayahuasca. Well, so then a reasonable question is to ask, well, then what's happening to all this melatonin that is being produced in pineal? Well, then if you tag it and follow its path through the metabolic system, you discover that the stuff is making its way quite directly to the surface of the skin. And then it's volatilizing away. What's happening here? A, a hallucinogenic molecule is being turned into a... And in the very center of the brain, and this pheromone is then hurrying on its way to the surface of the skin where it volatilizes off and affects uh, the ambient social environment in which you're living. This begins to look like a system of neurotransmitters and neuroregulators that operate not only within the body, but on the surface of the body and in the ambient social environment.
Yeah. I don't know if this relates to I'm not a chemist or anything like that. It, there was this stuff on the market called tryptophan, I believe. Right, it's an it amino acid. Amino acid. And it was taken off the market not too long ago. Yes. And um, supposedly it made you dream your dreams more clear or more vivid, something like that. Well, it's the precursor for DMT. If you were to make if you wanted to make trip DMT in the laboratory tryptophan would be one of the pathways that you could start from. Uh, the reason tryptophan was taken off the market, there was a lot of confusion initially, but it was a poisoned batch. It turned out all of the world's tryptophan was coming from one enormous stainless steel vat near Nagoya, and that it had been infected by a bacterium. and. Uh, so, you know, we're stuck with the fact that tryptophan will probably never again be available in health food stores. But it wasn't tryptophan that was the culprit. I yeah. knew someone whose life was completely messed up. By from the, the tryptophan? From the poisoned tryptophan. From the poisoned tryptophan. Yeah. So, by taking the tryptophan, then it, it caused DMT to be more... Well, no, saying it that way is saying too much. We don't know that. All we can say is tryptophan is an amino acid. It's used in the biosynthesis of many different compounds, including DMT. DMT peaks when dream states are peaking, and tryptophan does seem to induce deeper dreaming. It's a rational case. You know, we could sit here, sometime we could have a weekend entirely devoted to thinking of uh, simple experiments that could be done in the laboratory with and without human beings if only these things weren't illegal. I mean, there is so much to be learned and so little work being done because it's not sanctioned. I mean, my brother is a pharmaceutical chemist, a pharmacologist, plant physiologist, and his professional life is very touch and go because he's known to be a hallucinogen man. And they don't they don't hire you, they don't publish you, they don't fund you, they don't want to know. You have to be a very dedicated person to stick with hallucinogenic chemistry when you could get over into something else and make a lot of money. So you don't see a conspiracy then with the tryptophan being taken off the market because it made dreams being more vivid. You see it's just a bad batch. I mean, I made the connection without just thinking that I'm not a conspiracist, but it seemed to me awfully funny that that was taken off of being made by one batch and that batch got tampered with or whatever. Well, there may have been some form of hanky-panky, but in all fairness, you know, there are many approaches to the synthesis of DMT. Indole is probably what a, a, most chemists would probably prefer to start from indole. And indole is an industrial uh, precursor used in so many hundreds of ways that you could never push indole off the market. You'd have to reinvent half the pharmaceutical industry. But but where I'm going with that is, I'm talking about just being able to get it from a health food store. Here was tryptophan, and uh, it made your dreams vivid, more vivid. I, mean, I don't know if that's what people are using it for. I don't think so. But here it was, so maybe they, they felt that uh, people were dreaming too much, and so we've got, or they were having too vivid dreams that, hey, we can't have this anymore. We've got to sort of get it off the market. And maybe I think probably as long as you're asleep, they're fine about yeah. it. It's when you wake up that they get nervous. <laughs> uh, as long as you keep your eyes closed or you're glued to the boob tube, they're quite happy to minimalize you, marginalize you, and make you larval. Yeah. Um, I wanted. I was thinking about this thing with the um, elves and so forth, um, and I was also thinking about it in relationship to, you know, let's say you smoke DMT, you have the experience, you can put the term elves on them or speculate that what we have in various mythologies or uh, thought systems, elves, refers to that. I was wondering what you think about, um, you know, other types of deities that people may 
encounter in some sort of visionary experience, either with hallucinogens or not? I mean, what, what do you make of that? Do you have more of an archetypal interpretation, or do you think that they exist in some hyper-dimensional uh, reality uh, in some form? Or I, I'm just curious what I, you make of that. I guess I have an archetypal interpretation. I recall from some book of Robert Anton Wilson's where he, he suggests, he says you should, uh, you should pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary every day and offer, make offerings to her and put up her picture until she appears. Then switch to Shiva and do it till Shiva appears. Then Mickey Mouse. And just keep doing this until you satisfy yourself that none of these things are more real than any other and that whatever their ontological status, they're all equal in ontological status. Apparently the human brain is far more malleable than we can conceive of or imagine. We become imprisoned within a language and an ideology and it literally becomes uh, our reality. And yet it isn't our reality. Uh, it, it's just something provisional. I've not had that experience. I prayed for years as a kid, but perhaps the agonbite of Inuit was already present in me and making it impossible for me to succeed. But in the case of the, the elves, there's a... Uh there's sort of a cultural archetype of the elves, but at the same time, you seem to be saying that that there is a deeper reality that, that, that this is based on. In other words... Well, and the DMT elves are a lot weirder than the Disney elves. The Disney elves are really sanitized. These things are pretty frightening in a way. I mean, they are if you let yourself be frightened, because they're, you can't... They want... Well, how can I put it? They play too rough. They are not. They are not mean, but they're not careful either. It's like hanging out with a gang. You know, as long as you're their friend, you really feel, aren't I cool? Look who I'm hanging out with. But then you realize if you said the wrong word or made the wrong move, everybody would turn and look at you and just. The, I, I recently wrote the introduction for a new edition of Evans Vent's book, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries. And if you're interested in elves, this is the book to read. You all know who Evans Vent was. He was the great Tibetologist. Who, but as a student at Cambridge in 1913, before he went to Tibet, he did his doctoral thesis. 1913, this was. And he went around to Brittany and Wales and Ireland to the old, old people. I don't think he talked to anybody under 80. And he said, tell me stories about fairies. And he collected the most amazing stories about fairies and fairy encounters. And I learned from rereading that book that you know the, no, the Christian notion of purgatory, which is a place where you go that is neither heaven or hell, where you do time for minor infractions and then you get moved on to heaven? This idea was created, I always assumed that it was dreamed up by some bishops of Rome, some synod or something. It was dreamed up by St. Patrick to convert the pagan Irish to convince them that fairyland was part of the Christian map. And he was so successful in converting the pagan Irish that when letters went back to Rome describing how he did it, purgatory became a general doctrine of the church and then it was used very successfully to convert the pagan Slavs. So. Purgatory is fairyland dressed up in Christian terminology. And, and what is the idea of fairyland? It's the idea that the dead live all around us, linger among us as disincarnate souls. And they can, they, and the fairies 
that Evan Spence was describing were very ambiguous morally. I mean, sometimes they would only sour the milk. But, you know, their favorite concern of fairies is uh, UFO freaks pay attention, stealing babies. That's what fairies like to do. I don't know about surgically ripping off fetuses. That seems to be a modern touch. But in Ireland, people in the countryside do not leave babies, small babies, unattended in their cribs for fear of fairy theft. And the fairies substitute. They don't just leave an empty crib. They leave a withered, strange little creature that is supposed to fool the human beings. And whenever there is a child born who is wasting and old-looking and undersized, there's always the assumption that there was a healthy baby there, but now there's been a fairy switch. Uh, fairies respond to riddlery. This has to do with this thing about language and the strange relationship of the Irish to intoxication, fairies, and language suggests that here we might have a restricted gene pool that has somehow indemnified itself in the direction of these peculiar uh, concerns. Present company accepted. Who was the name of that book again? The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries by Evan Zwin. Um, at least a couple of final points, which is, you know, what is this all good for? I, th I think what it's good for, I think the mystery that we're making our way toward, much more of which will be revealed later as we live into the next 20 years, is that we have lost connection to a very important part of reality, which I call the Gaian mind, but what, which I think is more popularly understood as the goddess, goddess consciousness. But the goddess is not as envisioned by, at Ephesus, you know, a woman studded with breasts. The goddess is the living earth. It is not to be anthropomorphosed into uh, some kind of human or quasi-human form. And when we were taking mushrooms on the plains of Africa, before the invention of agriculture, as nomads, we were uh, rocked in the cradle of the goddess. And the you know differences between men and women between parents and children, between those who had much, if anybody had much, and those who had little, and between human beings and the animal and vegetable kingdom were minimal because everything operated in the light of this reference experience, boundary dissolution, and a sense of the intelligence of the earth. Now, we are so alienated from the intelligence of the earth that when we encounter it, we assume it came from halfway across the galaxy to rescue us. It isn't from across interstellar space. It's something that is partially in ourselves and partially in the world around us. And if we could but clear the prejudices of materialism from our uh, approach to the world, most especially from our language, which by its subject-object bias, by its linear syntax, and by God knows what else that's built into it, hopelessly precludes us from contacting this, uh, this reality. If we could clear all that away, we would discover you know, a dimension of immense support and affection for human beings and for our enterprises. But as long as we pursue the destruction of the earth and the elaboration of materialist ideology and the suppression of psychedelic states and the suppression of the feminine, 
we are going to be alienated, feel abandoned, and operate in an ambiance of rampant pathology. So, uh, to my mind, the, the hallucinogens are a call to return to the archaic style to recapture the tools, techniques, languages, and attitudes that existed and flourished on this planet, uh, you know, before A.D. 10,000. And we must do this. If we don't do this, uh, then we are setting ourselves up for a very unhappy future. We are living in a very unhappy world. Maybe your world is not unhappy, but, you know, tell that in Bosnia, tell it in Somalia, tell it to the AIDS-infected masses of Africa. Uh, the apocalypse is no longer a rumor. It's a ride in many parts of the world. And we, as the children, the inheritors of the culture which created this catastrophe, and as the people who are still above high, uh, still living on high ground, as the waters of poverty, epidemic disease, and misery rise ever higher, have a certain obligation to respond to this. Moral decency demands it. And we can no longer tolerate uh, the evolution of consciousness, the exploration of our relationships to each other, and the source of meaning itself to be regulated, stigmatized, and uh, degraded by the most frightened, the least educated, the least uh, balanced, and the least caring among us. And this is what we've got at the present moment. The male dominator uh, mentality is in the process of running us and all life on this planet into extinction. Uh, I don't have answers. That must be clear by now. I have questions and offer techniques. And there's nothing new about these techniques. They have been around for a hundred thousand years. And for 90,000 of those 100,000 years, they worked very well. And we existed in harmony with the rest of nature, fully human, fully able to philosophize, argue, love, riddle, perform theater, make masks, so forth and so on. But in the last 10,000 years, we have fallen into a pathology. And it's because the umbilical connection to the mind in nature has been severed, lost, pissed away, ignored, degraded, turned away from. It is a psychedelic relationship to these plants. Without that, you are not yourself. Without that, you are half human. And this is how we behave. We behave as though, you know, we have a soul, but it's stapled in Yeats' immensely compelling phrase to the body of a dying animal. This needs to be corrected, reconstructed, addressed. Otherwise, we are going to go into the books, if there are books, and into the cosmic record, which there surely is a cosmic record, as jerks, lame, <laughs> didn't get it, couldn't put it together. And this would be a terrible legacy because we are not going into these crises with, in a state of total anesthesia. We have the answers. We have the political machinery to do something about this. We have the sense of crisis. We have the goodwill and affection for each other. But we are somehow unable to put all this together in a configuration that would allow us to change our minds, admit that history was a bad idea, that science betrayed us, that it's a tale told by an idiot, and uh, to strike out in a new direction. 
we're like the frog in the proverbial pot who never moves as the temperature uh, climbs toward the boiling point. Sooner or later, you have to just get up on your hind legs and say, enough already. Now, maybe this is beginning to happen, and maybe it isn't. But it's not for us to judge as spectators at a hockey game. It's for us to get in and roll up our sleeves and participate in. Do what you think is right. Think about what you think is right. And once you've thought about it, then do it. And it doesn't have to fit in with my program or my agenda. I have a deep and abiding faith faith that Mother Nature will sort out the options and from the offerings of all of us select those that will be salvational and salutary for all the rest of us. But if you don't act, you didn't participate. I mean, this is not a road show, you know. It's your life, your planet, your world, and the tools to reclaim it are present at hand. You've heard this now. Now you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do about it? That's really all I have to say, and we're finished. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah.